Hello everyone and welcome to the Lit Up Lightworker podcast, empowering you with simple, practical, step-by-step -step spiritual tools and practices to follow your purpose and light up the world. You can access all episodes of the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher and TuneIn and be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos and interviews all about finding and following your life purpose. My name is George Lizos. I'm a spiritual teacher, psychic healer, the number one best-selling author of Be The Guru, Lightworkers Gotta Work and protect your light. And today I have with me Ari Wisner. Ari Wisner is a queer illustrator and designer based in London and is the author of the new Transient Light Tarot deck published by Hay House. Through art and card decks, Ari aims to create tangible tools to aid reflection, prompt intuition and promote authentic, peaceful living. Ari works primarily with the themes of transience, personal freedom, empowerment, queerness, balance and unity. Ari, welcome to the Lit Up Lightworker podcast. Hello, thank you very much. It's an honor, absolute honor. It's lovely to have you here to chat about your new deck, the Transient Lighter, which I have here with me. Those of you watching the video will see it and I love. And of course, I reviewed the deck as well for, for YouTube and I absolutely love it. So um, if you're watching or listening this right now, make sure to uh, Google George Lizos Transient Light Tarot and then you'll see the episode pop up on YouTube so you can see the whole uh, the whole deck. So I'm so excited to chat about the deck, but before we get there, I want to hear a little bit about your history with and your journey with spirituality, discovering your intuition and working with the tarot. I read something in your uh, in the guidebook for the book, so I have a clue, but why don't you let everyone know what this journey has been for you? Sure. Um... I'll try to keep it concise. <laughs> so um, I, I come from a very um, uh, religious uh, Christian background. I grew up in a, a smaller sect of Christianity, um, which has quite significant differences actually to mainstream Christianity. But um, basically I was brought up with a very uh, narrow view of the world and of spirituality and what the divine is. And um, so I was very, I was very committed to that. I didn't leave that religion until I was about 27, uh, 25, 27. Um, within that space, I could not be queer. I believed, I myself believed it was sinful and wrong. Um, and uh, so I married, I got divorced. I was chucked out of that church. Um, and then um, I started my spiritual journey outside of those walls. Um, so I started at looking uh, at some more sort of liberal Christianity and I started questioning my beliefs and uh, things didn't really get clear until I fell in love for the first time um, with a man. <laughs> and I, I left the church fully when I was 27 and I moved to London. Um, but the problem with was moving from that, um, I suddenly had this, this whole spirituality. I've always been a very spiritual person. Suddenly I didn't know what was true. Um, I didn't know, I couldn't, I didn't know how to listen to my own heart or my intuition. I'd always been taught that that was something that you shouldn't trust. Um, you know, I, I was believe, I, I believe that the, you trust the Lord only and not your own understanding. So um, I came across the tarot um, at a festival, <laughs> um, a lovely duo, um, cabaret tarot duo, uh, were doing some workshops and I, it just connected to me instantly, I think, because it was so visual and it gave me the power to um I think it 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 really touches visually it touches you inside if that makes sense and it reflects like a mirror and you realize that all these wisdoms that you're looking for are quite often just under the surface of your own skin you just need something to sort of draw them out um so that's how I got into tarot <laughs> um and uh obviously my perspectives on life and stuff has changed a lot since. Um, how I came to make the tarot um, was when the lockdown happened and um, I'm an illustrator, so it just seemed like a perfect challenge. Um, and I created my first tarot deck, which was um, a square tarot deck. Uh, but then it was the transient light, it was this deck that I, I really got personal with it. And to be honest, the creation of it was a cathartic healing journey for me. Um, so I started making it for myself alone. <laughs> Never thought I would self-publish it. Then I did self-publish it. Um, and then it went on to Hay House. So, um, yeah, 
<laughs> that's, that's, oh my that's goodness! That's a nutshell. nutshell um, yeah. of how I put this spot. I hear you. I, I got a, a bit emotional listening to your story, and you texted me yesterday. You're like, I. He, so Ari texted me yesterday, and and they were like, Oh my god! I I listened to your podcast with Hannah. We have kind of a similar story, and I I get the story now, and that's why I got a little well triggered in a good way, touched essentially because I too grew up in in an Orthodox Christianity. In Orthodox Christianity, I was brought up very religious, and I was very religious up until I was twenty, uh, sorry, fifteen years old, when because of all the dogma and not being able to accept the fact that I was gay, I actually tried to commit suicide and I stopped myself before I actually did it. And I'm like, you know what? Something needs to change. And that's when I entered my, my path. And now I'm the exact opposite. I'm a pagan. <laughs> I'm a Greek <laughs> pagan priest, like the exact opposite of like uh, Christianity. Uh, but it's, it's very interesting how when we go through an experience like that and we break through the dogma and then we, we liberate ourselves and we find freedom, something beautiful comes out of it. And we push the boundary of, of what is because so far tarot has been perceived a certain way. It had like 78 cards and a specific kind of symbolism, some specific kind of names. And because you were held within certain stereotypes for so long, having broken from that, you were in the creative space where you were like, you know what, let's just take, take Tarot and just create something new out of it, change it, expand it, bring it to the 21st century and the conversations we're having right now. So for those of, uh, of the listeners who haven't, um, who haven't experienced a transient light tarot yet, let's talk a little bit about how it's different from traditional tarot. So how is it different? Um, so I suppose the biggest change I've made is that I've gender neutralized it, which was a really interesting process. Um, I find that often in tarot traditionally, um, gender is kind of used, like gendered terms and visuals are kind of used as shorthand for what we perceive sometimes to be very opposite characters. So we think of, you know, uh, authority or strength um, as opposed to intuition and beauty and nurture. And um, I found that so problematic because not only is it problematic to assign characteristics to a gender, but also it, it takes away the link between the two that like you can't have strength without um, vulnerability and you can't have vulnerability without strength so um and as a queer person it just made sense I wanted a deck that was um not shadowed with those kind of gendered ideas um but I also didn't want to make uh like a novelty deck like this isn't a a queer deck you know it's not a it's not exclusively for queer people it, it it's it's just neutralizing those terms and those in that imagery so that's the main difference that I've made to it. Um, second is that it's plastic free. And because I self published it first, that's how I did it. And Hay House have been very, very gracious in um, finding a way of doing that um, because I, I believe they haven't done that before. Um, and they had to source a way of doing it that was cost effective and that could work. And, and they've done it really, really beautifully. I'm really thankful that they allowed me to keep that aspect of the deck when I was just printing it in very small batches. Um, so yeah, um, there's three bonus cards, um, the past, present and future. And um, I wrote a guidebook that's included and also within the guidebook, um, I have some beautiful um, bespoke poetry that my friend Fausta, um, I invited her in um, to create those specifically for the major arcana and also to introduce each um, house and she did a wonderful wonderful job um yes they're they're absolutely beautiful i love the poems they they just match the each suit so perfectly and let's talk about the the gender neutral cards that are there so that people are aware of them so can you can do you remember them all can you list them yeah sure um so starting with the court cards i renamed the king the crown the queen i renamed the keeper uh the knights i renamed the champions and the pages i renamed the apprentice um and then in the major arcana and um, the emperor and the empress i renamed to the let me get this right <laughs> there's a lot of words i've got i've got them, them. Um, it's the nurturer the nurturer 
the and nurturer, the defender. And the defender, and then we also have the revealer, which is temperance. Uh, no, that's the high priestess. Oh, that's the high priestess, and then temperance oh, yeah. is it the proclaimer? Yeah, the, no, so the proclaimer is the hierophant. Oh yes, the hierophant. Sorry, the hierophant, I keep yeah. confusing them. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Um, and by doing, by renaming them in this way, I think, because I wanted to, I wanted to, because th these cards mirror each other. And I think often I saw them when they were gendered as very opposite, whereas actually they work together really beautiful, like the proclaimer and the revealer. They're both about that kind of teaching role, but in a very different ways. One is yes. proclaiming and kind of imparting wisdom, whereas the other is more very, come and see, <laughs> come and see and use your intuition. And the same with the emperor and the empress um, they're very very similar and and um work off each other and overlap so i wanted to sort of get those nuances across both visually and in the name but just without saying this is the mother card or this is the pope card um because i just don't think uh, that gender language is needed or um useful Yes, and the, the same kind of energies are there. It's just in a more balanced way, which I, which I find so interesting. Now, let's talk about masculine and feminine energies because these are definitely energies that everybody's talking about. I talk about masculine and feminine energy in my book and, and, and how it relates to sexuality and gender and sex and all of that. So I think this is a perfect opportunity to have a conversation about that because I would love to hear the, the way you perceive those energies from a non-binary perspective. So the way that I've talked about them in, in my book, Lightworkers, has got to work. I'm, I'm saying that we have sex, which is biological. We have gender, which is social. It's somewhat something you choose. You have sexuality, which is biological. It's something that's given. Mm -hmm. And then you have masculine and feminine energy, which is spiritual and it exists within all these different domains and it flows mm -hmm. in a balanced way. Now, what is your perspective with regards to that and how do you perceive it? Are these terms needed or are they completely irrelevant at this point? I don't think they're needed but I totally understand why they exist. And I don't, um, I don't want to nullify that because they have their reason. So for example, um, I'm gonna go into Christianity here because that's my context. Um, my struggle when I was coming to terms with my sexuality and my gender identity and how that fitted with biblical ideas is that obviously the Bible has Adam and Eve and that's very gendered um, and very uh, opposite. And with reflection, I think what was the lesson, I think you, the, the story behind the Adam and Eve story is that if we wanted to illustrate love, how would you do that? The best way to do that is to take two opposites and bring them together. So of course, a beautiful illustration of love is to take two opposite um, genders or sexes. Um, but that doesn't mean that's the only way, way that love can manifest and and such. So I think how I see masculine energies and feminine energies is that they they're they're different characteristics that exist. Like there are opposing or opposite um, ends of the spectrum, but they don't need to be gendered because they totally overlap. Um, I really like to use the word strength and beauty. Um, I sometimes like to use the word vulnerability instead of beauty, but I think beauty is a bit more all-compassing, like uh, a broader term. And I think what's nice about these two um, words is it brings more of a sense of equality and also more of a sense of union. Um, and the whole universe is about unity, right? We are part of the universe, you know, from the day we're born, we're on borrowed time. You know, our matter and our spirit will go back to the universe once our transient light <laughs> has has faded, you know. And um, I think that's a really beautiful thing. Um, I don't know if that's starting to answer the question. I might be yes. off topic a little bit. Um, but that, that's how I see it. So I think when saying masculine um, energies, for example, traditionally, you'd use that for energies of authority or strength. Um, uh, or like more sort of defensive, harder um, energies, we can just use strength. We can use words like strength. And actually we can start to use more effective words for these characteristics. You know, this is not a feminine energy. This is a also a strong energy. It's a strength energy. It's a powerful energy. It's a intuitive energy. It's a beautiful energy. It's a caring energy. And um, 
by using language like this, you make it more accessible to anyone to um, relate to, right? Um, because I think sometimes when you draw a card and it's masculine, there's like a pressure that you need to, you need to relate to it. And if we use that kind of dinner language, that can be a barrier. I love that. I mean, I mean, masculine and feminine, there are labels that we've assigned to certain kind of energies, but the energies mm. exist without that label or not. If you go back to, uh, to ancient Greece and they had the gods and the goddesses, but each god and goddess, they, yes, they had masculine and feminine qualities, but they both have their opposite. For example, Aphrodite was also Aphroditus, who was like the, 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 the blending of both masculine and feminine energy. And that's where the word hermaphrodite came from, because it was both of those blends. So it's interesting how language has increasingly become more rigid. And now we're at a point where language needs to evolve to, to and change those heavy and um, heavy connotations that we have on those words and just create new words for it. And I found myself many times just wondering, okay, I also sometimes get triggered when I when with masculine and feminine energies. I'm like, but what do I call it? Like, how can I start embodying and, and use different labels to communicate these words? And I love how you used strength and beauty. It makes perfect sense. And, um, and I, I think also because I speak Greek and I speak Spanish as well. And I'm also trying to have those conversations with people in those languages. And I'm like, how do I communicate non-binary, for example, to my mom? I was having a conversation to my mom, like they, they exist in, uh, they, them is like how we, we call it in English. But in Greek, it sounds the same. It's written differently, but it's the same sound <laughs> for <laughs> Uh, for he sorry she her and they them the exact same sound i'm like how do i communicate how do we have those conversations so i think this is a, a great opportunity for everyone to start thinking in whatever language they're speaking how can they start evolving the language because change comes with us so let's talk about the uh well as i was going through the deck yesterday reviewing it for youtube I found myself asking certain questions, so I want to okay. share them with you. So in the suit of swords, and we're going to talk about the symbolism in every single suit, you, I noticed you use butterflies and you use mm -hmm. the eye in every single card almost. So <laughs> why, why is that? I'm like, hmm, why? <laughs> <laughs> What's the symbolism? <laughs> so um, as I said, I started this deck, it was for me, I was actually making it by hand um, with pens, and it was just gonna be a one-off deck. So I use symbols that um, have repeatedly been really important to me and like unique, you know, ones that just resonated with me. The reason I love the symbol of the butterfly is it's a symbol that I have been using since I was a kid. Since I was a kid, I've been drawing butterflies and it is an image of transformation. Um, and I think with the, house of swords this is all about the mind and i think i wanted to shift the focus of this uh this this realm on how the mind is transformed and like while we're alive like it's not about refining our knowledge and our wisdom to you know not being dogmatic and saying actually how can i be wiser by opening my mind how can i be transformed um how can i believe anything if i'm not willing to challenge it um, so I wanted to sort of thread the butterfly throughout um, the whole of the swords um, to sort of as a little reminder that like this is there's an opportunity to change your mind to challenge your mind um, and it, I think it also reflects the sword quite well you know it's like the sword is double-edged in tarot traditionally um, the butterfly has two wings there's two sides to every story it felt very um, appropriate um, and the eye, um, another symbol that I use a lot. <laughs> um, I think it's a little bit of a reminder of the divine. So in the first tarot deck that I created, the Trinity Tarot, um, there's a lot of focus on the eye being a symbol of divinity. Um, and I think for me, um, leaving religion, it was this sudden realization that I have to rely on my own mind and my own intelligence. And that actually I already have a slice of the divine within me. Um, and so I find that symbol very empowering, like, no, you can trust your mind, you know, um, as long as you're not closing your mind and as long as you're not, um, you know, just being swayed by anything that's said. Um, if you are honestly trying to be open-minded and, and stay interested and 
not be afraid of being wrong. Um, then that, I think that's the spirit of the divine. Um, so yeah, does it help? <laughs> yes, of course. It, it, it puts the story together. As soon as I saw the butterflies, I am like, okay, that's change, that's transformation. And then the I am like, okay, it's about looking within. And I'm, I'm glad you share the, the way you perceive it in your personal story. It makes the deck sort of uh, so much more personal. So let, let's talk about the other suits as well, because you changed the name of the cups to vessels, yeah. which I, 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 I laughed a little when, when I saw it because it was like, oh my God, there are different types of vessels here. We have boxes <laughs> and then we we have paints and we have like all these different types of vessels. So why did you remain, rename cups to vessels? What's the significance there mm. for you? So before I even started this deck and um, I spent the last couple of years thinking about the, the theme of transience, I had this sort of phrase that I sort of formulated in my head, which was that we are temporary vessels of eternity. Um, you know, I'd lost my faith and I had to find a concise way of stating what I do believe <laughs> um, and that was that I am a temporary ve vessel of eternity and actually so the original when I first published this uh, self-published it it had a different cover it was the skull that I used for the um, crown of vessels and that was actually the leading image of the whole project and it's this idea of this earthy skull this skull that has a limited life lifespan and it's it's tangible it rots away and magically it gets the opportunity to hold a slice of eternity and you know what encouragement does that give us to like take advantage and like use that life that we have what we have it um so from that phrase that temporary vessel of eternity i when i looked at the at the hearts i felt that that was appropriate it kind of crosses over because you know the skull represents the mind, but is, a, is, the, is the heart, it's the cups. But I felt that that was very appropriate as well. Um, and of our heart being like this vessel, which we manage the incomings, the outgoings. Um, and it also gave me the opportunity to take one of the suits and just have lots of fun with it because I couldn't decide on one. The others I found quite easy to stick with one, Whereas I was like, I can't, I can't. <laughs> I went to use paint tubes. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, so. It was it was so much fun to to like work with and, and just see because every single card has a different kind of vessel. And I'm like, this is just ingenious because like, why <laughs> just have the same camps over and over again in every single deck? So it was like more creative. So mm -hmm. let, let's move on to the suit of wands. Now, this is pretty uh, traditional in the sense that you have wands. Well, mm -hmm. kind of. Kind of, it's it's wands, but there are flowers there as well. So talk to me about uh, how you you imagined or reimagined this suit. So um, the flowers that I use throughout, they're kind of they look like daisies, um, but they um, I referenced a Bible verse basically, um, and I'm going to paraphrase this. It's not word for word, but the Bible verse basically likens our lives to um, flowers or lilies of the field that one day they're out and they're being beautiful <laughs> in the grass and at the end of summer they're tossed into the furnace which sounds really <laughs> terrifying but I just thought that was really beautiful this beautiful as again being a temporary vessel of eternity um it's another symbol that grounds that house to the idea of transience that um our spirit um is, is fleeting but very beautiful and inspiring and I, th I also sort of think of daisy chains. <laughs> you know, I used to spend hours when I was a kid making daisy chains, and I think inspiration, and this is the realm, um, the ones is the realm of inspiration and creativity. Um, the things that truly move you links very closely to childhood and who you are um, at birth and what you're sort of destined to be. So I kind of wanted to bring that kind of child, childlike um, feeling. Again, personal symbol. And I, I know other people read it in different ways. No, I love the personal symbols. I think that's what makes this deck so uh, unique is that it's very personal and you can tell it feels like it feels very homey. <laughs> it feels yeah. like it's very personal to the to the to the to the to the reader like using the deck. And then we go into the uh, the pentacles, which you renamed as coins. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. I've seen other decks that have renamed it coins, but you retained 
the uh, the pentagram symbol. Um, so let's talk about that. So <laughs> I like the use of the pentagram symbol. Um, I so I was quite I did this quite naively in terms of I hadn't really looked at many of the decks. I I, I learned on the Rider Waite Smith. So I hadn't looked at many more decks when I started designing mine. It wasn't really until I self-published when I started talking to other deck creators and um, started building up a collection. Um, I felt like the word pentacle can be a barrier for some people. I didn't want to make this deck more accessible. So I, it was kind of a meet in the middle, really. It was like, oh, I'm going to keep the visual, but I'm going to change the word to be a bit softer. Um, and uh, the sort of reoccurring image in here is, is the fruit and the plants in the garden, which I just love. Um, the symbol of a secret garden is very personal to me again. Um, and uh, I was also, I was staying over lockdown, I was staying with my parents um, uh, in the countryside. And my mum has this beautiful, beautiful garden that she And um, I think there's a lot of references. There's lots of little references in the deck um, to that garden, to that countryside. Um, all the champion cards, the knight cards, are used birds. Um, uh, one of which is um, kites that fly around in that area. So again, that was more of a personal symbol. <laughs> but it just comes back to um, where I was, I guess, when I was making it. I love it. And I, I agree with you that pentacles can seem limiting for some people because, I mean, they're very connected to, um, to witchcraft as well. Mm -hmm. So coins, I think, makes it more accessible to everyone. And then you have the, um, the past, present, future cards, yeah. which I, w I was going through it while I was like reviewing it without like thinking about it. And I'm like, hmm, I I'm sure there is a connection between the cards. I'm just going to share them here so everybody can yeah. see. I'm like, I started putting them together. I mean, I, I see a DNA strand. I wonder if they fit in together and they do. And it's basically one single image divided into three cards. And then you have the past where you plant the seeds, you have the present where the seeds are growing, and then the future they grow into trees, which is, is a beautiful symbolism. Now talk to us a little bit about those cards and why you chose to include them. Um, so three is a very important number to me, um, partly because it relates to the past, present, future, but it also um, for me relates to the sort of three ways that the divine is manifested. Um, the church that I grew up in don't believe in the Trinity, although that's usually part of Christianity. Um, and I, when I was challenging my beliefs, I looked into the Trinity a lot. And um, I started having these sort of realizations in my study that three was so important in understanding how the divine works in terms of unity. And um, I was always taught that God is one. And um, it's true, like the divine, is one we are all part of this one thing you know i'm a unit your unit but we're part of a larger unit and so i kind of see that as a, a three-part manifestation <laughs> um and the present the one in the middle is where we currently sit and that's where the divine and humanity kind of like collide you know we are physical matter but we have the ability to be spiritual and to love and to create and to um, imagine and to sadly hate and all sorts. Um, and it's become quite understood now that one of the one of the most important things to understand in living well and healthily is to practice presence and to be present, not to be judged all um, by the past or to be stuck in the past, but also not to be you know, engulfed in anxiety about the future. And I open, I open the, the guidebook with a poem about sitting in the neck of um, an hourglass. The idea being that the, the future is above you, the past is behind you, and you just have to sit at the, it's on the back of the cards. Yeah. Yeah. You have to sit in that center. Um, so I thought I wanted to bring that, that three out in these bonus cards. And what I tried to do with the helix is sort of show the micro and the macro visuals. So we start with the past with the DNA and the future, the whole universe, to try and get that, to visually show that that hourglass and what this is, that we are sitting yeah. in such a huge, unfathomable, un <laughs> something that we can't 
comprehend how large it is. Yes. And how that's such a privilege. It's such a privilege and such a beautiful thing that we have. Um, I think that's something that we can take so much courage from and encouragement and um, gratitude with, um, you know, to embrace transience, to embrace that everything has an end. We have to be able to see the joy without any promise of something ahead. You know, um, you can't guarantee what's coming next, um, but you shouldn't need that to feel peace and joy, if that makes sense. I think that these three cards, the past and the present, the future, perfectly describe the essence of this deck because it's the transient light tarot. It's all about change. It's all about transformation. And I think those three cards just like encapsulate this energy. It's the past that's changing into the present, which is symbolized by the hourglass that's constantly flowing and changing, and then going into the future, which is also like ever expanding and unknown and just constantly changing. What a beautiful way to perceive life and tarot is a way to to mirror life and to guide us in living our life is there a specific way that you would like people to work with these three cards no i i kind of left it up to people to interpret how they how they like i mean how i how i prefer to use them i use them two ways either i leave them in the deck and i just use it as like if it comes up as a card i just use that as a focus card okay we need to think about the future we need to think about the present um some people i've seen that some people um on social media use them almost like a uh a spread map so they just they lay them out on the table and then they pick a card for each um one suggestion about having the guidebook is that if you turn them around and put them back in the deck and shuffle um then whichever ones they sort of face whichever ones they kiss are the cards that you choose so if you want to do a past present future reading um so go wild with it <laughs> use them how you like yeah um, I'm, I'm quite happy with that yeah, another thing that makes this, this deck differently, like use the cards the way you want to make it your own. I think I yeah. think you actually say that at some point in the in the guidebook, like make this tarot practice your own and use the deck how you like it. I like how open and accessible it is. I found myself as I, I grew on my spiritual path going away from tarot a little bit, although like I'm still obsessed and I have like a whole selection of decks because of the of the <laughs> archaic symbolism that I didn't want to relate to sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, But these cards just brought me closer a little bit because I'm like, you know what? I don't need to use this specific symbolism. I can use uh, like more neutral symbols that still help me understand those kind of energies. Oh my goodness. Ari, thank you so much for sharing your beautiful deck with the world. I know you have a coupon code lit up to give people 20% off. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. Um, so that works on my website. So if you order um, a deck from ariwisner.com and use the code lit up, um, that is it, isn't it? Lit yes, up, that's, that's why. Right. <laughs> um, then you'll then you'll get a a um, a discount, and um, all the decks I sell through my website are signed um, and hand wrapped by me, and like the ones from Amazon. Just saying, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and that's that's valid. Um, I think until the end of the year, so um, go use it. Perfect. Thank you so much. Can you please let everyone know where they can get in touch with you? Sure. Um, so you, you can get in touch via my website as well, um, ariwisner.com. Um, or um, Instagram is my most preferred social platform, and that's just ari underscore wisner um, on Instagram. And it's the same again for uh, TikTok, if anyone is using that. Perfect. And all the links will be available in the show notes below. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. And I'm so excited for everyone to experience the magic of the transient light tarot.